Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk a little bit more about Seth and caching tears. So we are going to set up a new caching tier for my Seth cluster. And usually if you have different kinds of hardware in your system, then a caching tier could be an excellent choice for you. In my case, I only have four hard drives that are similar. All of them are spinning rust and not really SSDs or anything really fast. But if you have, for instance, a bunch of NVMe drives and then a lot of simple, a, uh, simple hard drives, then you can use the hard drives as your backend with all their extra data in and then the NVMe as a simple uh, caching layer above that that could be really fast and really performant for you. So let's switch over here to my little cluster. We see here that I have four uh, OSDs on simple hard drives so they are not particularly fast. If we look at my pools here we see I have a data pool, I have a metadata and I have device metrics and I have some read and writes that goes on to my data pool here. If we change this up a little bit more so it's more readable, we see that I have a lot of usage and I have some clean uh, pages here. And we can also look at this crush rule set. So this is the replicated rule. And this actually tells the uh, system that this pool should be pushed to these specific drives. So you can create crush rule for all your SSDs, you can create one for your uh, hard drives and one for your NVMEs, or you can have an other that you say that this specific rack should be the fast drives and then I have another bunch of drives in a co-location and those should be in a different role set. So you can uh, set this up pretty much how you like and use the different built-in structure of tiering where things are located and what kinds of hard drive this is to create your specific rule in order to um, decide where things should be. I'm not going to go into this today but it's crucial to know because if you have NVMe drives you have one crush rule for one pool and then you create another pool which should be the faster drives on another crush rule so that's important to know. So let's uh, see here, we will switch over here to uh, my little script. So I've written something here that I want to add a caching tier to my file system. So first we can uh, run this little thing that we look at the file system, what kind of pools we have. Uh, let's see if we can push that in there. LS pool will give you what kind of pools you have. You have Ceph data, metadata, and health metrics. So that was what we saw earlier. What I want now is create one more pool that should be for this fast drives. And even if I have the same drives, a smaller pool could actually be faster in the time of access because you have smaller sets of keys and easier way to find uh, things in the pool. So I have a little bit of a benefit to have a separate pool for caching but it's not as much of a benefit as it would be if I had different kinds of the hardware. Uh, so we create a new pool here, nothing new there. So we have this hot storage, uh, which has 32 pages. So if we go back here, we see that we now have created this hot storage with 34 to unknown, and now they are clean. So we have one new pool, which has no activity whatsoever in it. Uh, then we want to set this as a tier to the standard data. Metadata is not that is important, but of course you can set that so it will be moved over to your fast drives. But metadata is such a little um, amount of data, so actually caching it up and having different pools for it might not be required. But the data is very much larger, so having um, cost-effective drives that has the backend storage and then have fast drives as a caching tier is much more uh, efficient. So let's put that in. So I have a caching tier here. So now this pool should be a caching tier for the data. Still no traffic here. 
and uh, then I can say that I want to set it hot storage as a write back for the uh, at, in the mode of write back. So you have two different modes that are important here. You have write back, which means that you take data and re re write to this pool, and then after a while you will flush that data back to your backend pool. And if you read things, it will cache it and give the data back. And if it doesn't have it, it will send the traffic back. Another that you can have is a read proxy. Then all the writes will go to the backend pool, but you will handle only the reads. So it will be a caching layer. If you read a lot, then it will cache those uh, elements that are read a lot and uh, give those a faster access but will not take the actual writes. Good part with uh, handling the writes as well is if you have slower drives in the background, you don't want the writes to wait for those drives. So we put this into write back and still we have no traffic here and we will set this as a lay overlay for the data as well. So that's the last command that we need to do in order for this to be up and running. So now the traffic should be moving slowly over to this caching hot storage. Uh, but we can talk, you see that it gets some reads already. It will probably get some writes later on as well. And it will fill up so it has more storage in it. But there is a couple of other things that we can set as well. First off, we have a memory cache that we can use in order to have a bunch of different things stored in memory for fast access. And then if they are read a bunch of times, we can keep them in our caching pool. And there is one filter for this called Bloom that we can set. Uh, there is two other filters as well, but those are just for testing purposes at the moment. I think it's explicit hashing algorithm and explicit um, storage or something like that but those are not <laughs> uh, main or something that you should run in production but bloom is the filter that is usually set uh, then you can say that i want to have 12 copies of the data in memory in order to have really fast access to it uh, so you have a, a couple of different uh, uh, hit counters in uh, in that traffic and you can also say how long should it be saved in this case it's uh, four hours that i want to cache things in memory in order to be sure that i have a fast access to it so that's things that you can set up in order to have even faster access to your data next up you can set up an upper limit for your hot storage. So if you don't want to use the full drive, you can say that I want you to only use one terabyte of data, or perhaps you don't only want to save a million objects and no more, then you can set these so you can have an upper limit so you don't run too much data in your uh, NVMe cluster. And that could be good, for instance, if you have object storage that has really fast drives and then you have a file system that you want a caching pool for. So perhaps the file system needs to be limited in some cases in order to not hinder the object store. So this could be good for that. Then we will have this min regency for promote to and this is how many reads or writes that needs to be done on a specific object before it's promoted to this caching pool. And a good number is actually to set this to two, it's recommended. You can set it to more if you don't want it to cache to the pool earlier, or you can set it to one and then every read and every write, it will be cached in the pool. Uh, we see here that we already have uh, almost a gigabyte of memory, a uh, gigabyte of uh, data saved in this pool here. So it start, it's starting to get used uh, pretty fast uh, because I have a lot of traffic that goes on here or not a lot of traffic but, but a bit of traffic um, then we have the flushing store uh, <laughs> set up so this can be good if you want uh, if you have this upper limit so if we have said that we want max of a million objects or a max target bytes then you can say if it's in 40% uh, is dirty, so you have already written 14%. Uh, 
th then it's, it needs to be flushed. You need to uh, start flushing things. And if it's high dirty range, in this case 60%, then it will flush uh, even more aggressively. And if it's full ratio, so if it's 80%, then it will just flush every object independent on how long it has been in the cache because then it's almost full. So you need to push those objects out really fast. Um, so these are things that you can set in order to handle this upper limit, this max. Uh, so you can flush uh, objects out if you get a lot of reads and a lot of writes into it so you don't go over your limit. And last but not least we can set a policy for how long should the object be in our cache before it's written back to the backend storage. And that's good if you have slow drives you want to keep it in the cache for a while and then write it back. Uh, in this case I set 10 minutes. so. The object will be kept in my cache for 10 minutes and not even written to the backend storage and after 10 minutes it will be flushed back uh, and this is uh, occurring in cycles which is good because then you can write a lot of objects and when the time limit is up it will flush a bunch of them to backend storage which could be an improvement in latency if you have slow drives. Not, next up we have the eviction policy and this is 30 minutes and this is how long should the object that I read from my backend storage be kept in this cache pool until it's evicted back to the backend storage. So if it's not used for half an hour it will be removed from the cache storage. If you have objects that needs to be there longer, you can of course set this to more, it's in seconds. So for instance, you can have data that are valid for a week, that could be a, a setting or so on. So you have a lot of different values that you can set to your caching pool. And I'm just scratching the surface here. There is a lot more things that you can configure to your caching pool, but these were the ones that I thought was really important to know about and can really give you benefit in a live environment. After we've done that, we can do the reverse. We can remove the caching tier layer. I will not do it now because I want to keep this, but then you use uh, the first here, set it over to the read proxy mode. So all the things that are written will be flushed out of your system not evicted, just flushed out. So after 20 minutes, if you had the setting before that you kept it for 10 minutes, so 20 minutes later, all objects should have been flushed, then you can uh, be sure that you don't have anything that is in this caching layer that isn't in your backend uh, pool. Uh, if you will want to be really sure, you can first off do this Raiders P hot storage L ls and see what is the in this pool what our objects are in it and you will get a long list of objects and then you can say that you want to cache, uh, cache flush evict all and it will go through object for object and push them back and also remove them from the pool but keep in mind that if you do that if you do an ls after that all those objects that are read again will be in your caching layer so you will not remove all of them. You can set this caching mood, uh, mode to none and in that case it will not re even read things and then you can evict all of them. But I would say that you don't really need to do that. You can have it in a read proxy mode, flush and evict all and after that you should be totally safe to remove this. Then you will remove the overlay so with, uh, and the uh, caching tier. And after that, no reads or writes will be done to this specific pool. So it's separated from your environment and it is safe to remove it after that. But as you see here, they have really added a lot of safety around removing pools. Because when you remove a pool, the data is gone forever. You have deleted the data. Very important. So, in order to do this, you first need to tell the monitor that I allow to delete things, uh, <laughs> delete pools. And after you have set that variable, you can go in and say, I want to delete hot storage. And then you need to repeat hot storage again. So you say, I want to delete this pool, this pool, 
and then you need to have the flag yes i really really mean it in that case it will remove it uh, so these are <laughs> security measures to really ensure that you don't delete data that you need or any pools that you actually are using at the moment and after you are done with that you can set the flag to the monitor backs that you don't allow pool deletion because this is not a really safe oper operation to do if you remove a pool that you're not using that's totally safe of course but they don't want you to accidentally remove pools that are in use. So this was what I wanted to cover today. I hope that you found this interesting. Are you using Ceph with the caching pool already? Please leave a comment in the comment section down below if you thought this was interesting and have separate use cases that I haven't th thought about. Leave a comment about that. If you have any other uh, questions or suggestions, those are welcome too. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.